And really, we look as if we are the same kind of being. And yet, what we have been finding over the past few weeks is that we really do belong to two different worlds. That we are divided. And it's very important that we see what we have in common. Otherwise, we couldn't be of any use to each other. But it's equally important to see that we are of two different worlds. And maybe the person beside you could live in an entirely different world to you. And maybe the person behind you is a very, very different kind of being to you. This is what I mean. Some of us are utterly preoccupied with our physical and mental needs. That's the world we live in. It's just good to be honest about it, you know. So, that's important. If this describes you, be real about it. Don't say, oh, well, he's describing the bad ones now. Let me wait for the good ones. No, let's be real about it so that God can give us some honesty or truth. Maybe some of us who think we belong to the good guys that aren't really with the good guys. And so, it's very important to break the old patterns of our thinking, loved ones. And some of us are utterly preoccupied with Will we get a new stereo? Or will we get a new car? Or the new coat that we're going to get? Or we're all taken up with whether we should buy a new lipstick or not? Or we're preoccupied with whether we're fat or whether we're thin? Whether we look good or whether we don't look good? And really, that's what governs our life. Those are the reasons we work, too. And loved ones, be real. Many of us are like that, you know. So don't sit there and say, Oh, no, no, I know you're preparing us for something here. No, that's not me, that's not me. Be real. Some of us regard those as the reasons for working. Indeed, if we hadn't those reasons, we would be glad enough not to work. We really just work because we have to work to get money to get these things. And if we hadn't these things to think of, we'd kind of be pretty bored and we'd wonder what to do with our lives. The hours would just seem to drag on. And so, there are many of us who belong to that world. Really, you know, we are not much better, truly, than sophisticated little animals. You know, really we are. We're just sophisticated little animals. We're all taken up with whether we'll have a dry bed for the rest of our lives, where our next meal is going to come from, and that tends to be our preoccupation. And that's the kind of people that are described in a verse that really we've, we've looked at before. It's Ephesians 2 and verse 3. Ephesians 2 and verse 3. And it's page 1017 in that black RSV. 1017. And it's Ephesians 2 and verse 3. And some of us belong to this world and It's better for us just to face it, you know, and be honest about it. Among these, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. And the passions doesn't need to be filled with lust and tremendous emotional fervor. Passions in the Greek can mean just the desires of our flesh. Following the desires of body and mind. And so we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And many of us belong to that world. Our lives are governed by the desires of our bodies and minds. And we keep trying to find distinctions between ourselves and our little dogs, but really we're not very different. Dry bed, shelter, food, and can we play after work? And that tends to be it. And we kind of try to make it a little more sophisticated and decorate it a little with a little interest in philosophy, 
But that is basically what governs our lives. Now, there are others of us here this morning who govern our lives not by the appetites of our body or by the desires of our minds and emotions, but we govern our lives by a spirit that is inside us. We really do believe there is a divine employment service. We believe that. We believe there is a divine labor exchange. And we believe that the creator of the universe put us here to do a particular job and to express a vital part of himself that he couldn't express through anybody else in the universe. And we have begun to know his mind. And we've begun to understand how he thinks through this invisible spirit that we received by simply asking him for this spirit. And this spirit has begun to let us sense what the creator of the world is after. It doesn't bother us that the spirit is invisible because we know all the most precious things in the world like love and atoms are invisible. And so we realize that, yeah, the things that govern the whole world are invisible things. So that this Holy Spirit is invisible does not trouble us. But we have begun to find that he guides and directs what we do day by day. And that is what governs us. And we're governed by that. So we're really interested in what this creator wants to do in certain situations that come up in our lives. And we're interested in any, every movement we see that tends to be bringing about his order for his world. And we spend our lives interested in how we can forward that whole drive towards order that he is trying to bring about. Uh, Material needs are a marginal thing with us. We know that he is going to give us what we need as long as we do the job that he wants us to do. And so we spend most of our time preoccupied with him, really interested in what he's trying to do, really interested in what he wants us to do. And so recession comes along, and yeah, we suffer like everybody else, but we do believe that if we take care of what he's given us to take care of, he'll take care of our needs. And so we live in that kind of a a world that is really governed by this Spirit of God. And uh, you remember we came across that in the verse we studied last Sunday, Romans 8 and 14. Romans 8 and 14. And it's page 983, 983. And Romans 8 and verse 14. And it runs like this. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So there are some of us here this morning who are that kind of being. We are sons and daughters of God. And we believe we belong to that world. We spend most of our time thinking of our loving Father. And getting to know Him and getting to understand Him. Now, loved ones, that's the situation. And I think most of you would agree that More or less, all of us here belong to either one world or the other. Now, how do you know which you belong to? Do you just keep hoping and then find out when you die which one you belong to? Or is there any way by which you can know? You can know for sure what kind of being you are. Because, loved ones, some of us here are just going to die out at the end of this life, you know. Or we're going to go into the kind of no exit self-torture that Sartre talks about in that play. But we're either going to go into that kind of self-torturing experience forever, or we're going to go in and live with this being who started the whole thing that we have around us. And so it is important to know which way you're heading, if only so that you can do something about it. How do you know the difference? A loved one's the... This Romans 8 and 16 really makes it very clear. Romans 8 and 16, it is possible to know whether you are a son or daughter of God or not. It is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit 
that we are children of God. That's how you know. It's important that he's given us that clear direction because a lot of us are anxious to persuade ourselves that we are children of God. We think if we have some holy aspirations or come to church uh, now and again or even come to church regularly that we probably are children of God. We think when we have an odd, generous, loving feeling towards somebody else, oh, we must be a child of God. We think when we believe that Jesus died for the whole world, therefore we must be children of God. We'll even believe that if we think at times that he might have died for us, We must be children of God. We're always anxious, loved ones. We human beings are incorrigibly proud, presumptuous things. And we are always anxious to persuade ourselves that we are better than we really are. And that's why it's so important to face the ground of Christian assurance here very plainly so that you won't persuade yourself. You know how persuaded we are we're a Christian nation and how ridiculous the very concept is. You know how easily we want to look at the good side of ourselves. So, would you look with me just at these signs, clear signs, that give you an assurance that you're a child of God. Do you see the verse? There are two spirits mentioned, dear ones. One is, has a capital S. You see that? It is the spirit. It's uh, henuma. Is there a Greek scholar? Is it masculine or feminine? Come on, Greek scholars. Okay. Hey, I'll have a go at hey. Hey, Numa. It, it, it is the. Hey is the article in Greek. And when you get the article, it is always translated in English by a capital S, you see. Whereas the next word, spirit, did not have an article. And it's translated a small s. So you see, there are two spirits mentioned. And it's the witness of both these spirits that assure us that we are children of God. That enable us to know that if we die this moment, we go straight to be with the creator of the universe and live in a more beautiful world than this. And that first spirit is God's spirit, capital S. And the second spirit is the human spirit. So you see, we have human spirits. Otherwise, we couldn't receive God's spirit into us at all. God's spirit can't come into your mind because it's not intellectual life can't come into your emotions because it's not emotional life, can't come into your body because it's not physical life. It has to come into a part of you that is spiritual itself. And you have a human spirit. Uh, When dear ones contact uh, uh, evil spirits, they're using their spirit to contact evil spirits. Or when you begin to play around with ESP, you're getting into that level Uh, where the psyche is being raised to the nth degree, where it's just about to be involved with mediums and with the spiritual world, the evil spiritual world. So all of us have spirits. And it's that human spirit that provides part of the witness, and the Spirit of God provides the rest of the witness that you're a child of God. Now, what is the witness of God's spirit? Well, it's really very easy to understand it if you keep in mind that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is the third person of the Trinity. So the Spirit of God is a person. He's a person. So you can have the relationship with Him that you can have with an ordinary person and you can have the awareness and the consciousness of what He knows about you that an ordinary person can have. Do you know Leighton Carlson? So some of us say, no, no, I never heard of him. And some people in the New Testament, you remember, said, no, I never even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. And so uh, some of us would take that attitude to that name, Leighton Carlson, or I could mention, and you could mention, a dozen other names. And you would all say, No, no, I don't know him at all. Now, it is possible to have that consciousness of your relationship or your lack of relationship with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit. Loved ones, it is. It isn't a whole lot of mumbo-jumbo. It's just, do I know the Holy Spirit? Do I know Jesus? Well, you either know him or you don't know him. Now, some of you may answer, well, no, I don't know Leighton Carlson. But I've heard about him. 
I've heard about him through other people. But uh, I don't really know him myself. So some of you this morning may say, well, I've heard you talking, brother, about Jesus and about the Holy Spirit, and so I know a lot about them. Yeah, I kind of know about them, but I really don't know them myself. And then some of you could go a little further and say, well, yeah, I know Leighton Carlson, but he doesn't know me. And I'd put it to you, loved ones, wouldn't you know that he doesn't know you? Isn't that true? I mean, you don't sit there and say, well, I know Leighton Carlson, but I don't know whether he knows me or not. You know that. You sit there and you're, you're all taking the attitude, yeah, I know him or I don't know him, but one thing you do know is whether he knows you or not. So you either sit there and say, well, I know him, but he doesn't know me, or you sit there and say, I know him and I know that he knows me. That's just a personal relationship that we have with each other. You know that, dear ones, because a lot of you know me, and I see your dear faces, and I know you to see, but I really don't know you personally. And if somebody came to me and mentioned your name, and maybe you, well, you know whether I know you or not, and they said, do you know so-and-so, I would have to say, well, no, I don't know them. And they would say, well, they know you. But do you see that a deep relationship means that you know the other person and you know that they know you? So some of you would say, yeah, I know Leighton Carlson and I know that he knows me. Now you can know that, loved ones. Now it's the same with this dear Holy Spirit and with Jesus. If I ask you, do you know Jesus or do you know the Holy Spirit? And do you know that they know you? you have a deep sense inside of whether that's so or not. Now you do. You know. Now that's part of the witness of God's Spirit. When you can say, yeah, I know Jesus, and I know the Holy Spirit, and I know that this Jesus knows me. Now loved ones, you can say that, or you can fail to say it. But that's part of the witness of God's Spirit. The Holy Spirit witnesses inside you whether he is satisfied with you and whether he knows you and whether his Son, his Lord Jesus, knows you or not. The Holy Spirit's task is to give you that sense inside. So, do you see that? So, it's no use you kind of sitting there and saying, Oh, well, I, I mean, I, I kind of know Jesus. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of do. Yeah, I know him. But do you know that he knows you? That's it. And you can kind of say, Oh, well, intellectually, I conclude that he's the Son of God and he knows all things, so he must know me. Yeah, but you know that's not my question. I'm asking you, do you know personally in your own heart that Jesus knows you, that he's met you? that he's encountered you, that he understands you, that he's talked with you, that you and he have discussed things together in prayer or walking along the road. Now, that's part of the witness of God's Spirit. That's part of how the Holy Spirit lets you know if Jesus is really satisfied with you. Now, you can say, oh, in what way satisfied? Well, you know the way any personal relationship goes. It goes like that, doesn't it? I mean, whether it's husband and wife here this morning, or whether it's roommates, or whether it's old school friends, or whether it's business colleagues, that's the way it goes. You know, one, one gets a wee bit ahead of the other, uh, maybe about Christianity, or maybe about opera, or about uh, politics, and they're a little apart from each other. And then the other one kind of catches up, and they're at one again. And then the other gets a little further in insight on some other subject. And then the other one kind of catches up. And I suppose that a divorce comes, doesn't it, when, when they don't wait for each other, when they don't love each other enough to, to let the other person catch up. But that's the way any relationship goes, whether it's marital or whether it's business. The one person is moving at different speeds, but they keep catching up. You certainly know when you're together on something, don't you? 
If you're a husband and wife here, you certainly know when you're together, yeah? You could almost list them. Yeah, I'm together with them and that. I'm not together with them and that. I'm together with them. And it's the same with roommates. Yeah, we can get along well together on this area, but don't take us on to that area. And don't touch Vietnam, but we're okay on Latin America. And so we can, we can kind of list the things. And we know when our relationship, when in our relationship we're one with each other. And that's the way it works. Now, you certainly know when you're not at one, don't you? Have you ever had the experience of meeting an old school friend with whom you were very, very close when you were at school? And you so look forward to getting together again. And you start off with some of the superficial things, you know, you remember so and so and so and so and you remember. And it looks great. And it feels as if you're just taking up where you left off. And you just sense that. Oh, we're just back where we were. And then you begin to talk about some other things. And you begin to find that their life has gone away out in that direction. And your life is way out there. There comes a time when the conversation kind of stops. And you don't have anything more to say. So you certainly know when you're not together with a person. Loved ones, that's with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can witness to you when he has moved into a new piece of light that you have not moved into yourself. And you'll sense a feeling of being apart from him. You'll lose the sense of his witness in your life. So the Holy Spirit, you see, is always moving one step ahead, then waiting for you to catch up. Now, if you don't catch up with what he's showing you, then you'll miss that sense of oneness with the Holy Spirit. You'll miss the witness of God's Spirit. So he initially, you remember, shows us that we're living for ourselves. That's all we care about. We just live for ourselves. We live for our own satisfaction, for our own fame, for our own comfort. And he shows us that it was that drive to live for self that God destroyed when he destroyed us in Jesus on the cross. And he introduces us to the whole principle of dying to ourselves and dying to living for ourselves. Now, the Holy Spirit at that point with most of us is a little bit ahead. He's just a little bit ahead of us. Now, if you don't move up with him into that light, you will not have his witness that you are a child of God. And then, you remember, he moves on another step and he begins to show you how this applies to different areas of your life. And he shows you that your clothes are not your own to do or to buy or to repair as you want. Your career is not your own. That you're not here to eat, to live, but you're here, you're not here to live to eat, but to eat to live. That your your eating habits are not in your own control. That you're Uh, relationships with other people are not your own to govern as you want. And he gets a little ahead of you. Now, loved ones, if you don't move up with him into that area, you lack the witness of God's Spirit that you're a child of God. In other words, the witness of God's Spirit depends on you keeping an up-to-date relationship with him in moving into the new light that he's showing you. Really, it comes to this, that the witness of God's Spirit depends on your up to the moment, submission to him. That's why some of you have doubts at times. You know, some of you wonder, oh, am I a Christian or am I not a Christian? Well, it's because at that point, the Holy Spirit is probably showing you something new and you're holding back on it. And God is so good, you know, he's built us so like himself that we know inside ourselves there's something not right. There's something rotten in the state of Denmark. There's something not right inside. And we know it. And we know that, yeah, we're pulling, we're pulling, yeah, we're dragging our heels. And we know he's showing us new light. But we're dragging back and yet we're keeping on saying, yeah, praise the Lord, hallelujah, I'm a child of God. And yet it hangs heavy on our hearts. Now, loved ones, the only way to experience God's, the witness of God's spirit, that you are his child, is to keep that up-to-date relationship with the new light you're walking into. But that's part of the witness of God's spirit. God's Spirit gives you a sense of whether he knows you or not, whether Jesus knows you or not, and whether they're both satisfied and pleased with you or not. You can know that inside. Of course, that's the kind of 
assurance that can carry you through hideous situations, you know. But that's why you remember Jesus said, if you do the will of my Father, you'll know that what I say is true. See? If you do the will of my Father, you'll know that what I say is true. If you do the will of my Father, you'll know, you'll sense that this is right. But if you don't do the will of my Father, you'll begin to doubt the things that you even were sure of before. So the witness of God's Spirit moves like that. Now, what's the witness of our own spirit, dear ones? Because that's what really the second part of the verse is talking about. It is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Because there are uh, deceptive spirits that would try to imitate the witness of God's Spirit. And that's why God's Word joins the witness of his own spirit with the witness of our own spirits. Now, what is the witness of our own spirit? Well, the witness of our own spirit is a more empirical kind of thing. It's not such an inner thing. The witness of our own spirit comes because our own spirit is touched by Jesus' spirit and our own spirit becomes like Jesus. So the witness of our own spirit is simply seeing what comes out of our own spirit. It's simply looking at the kind of attitude that comes out of our own spirit. So uh, there are certain marks. You can find one of them in Psalm 51 and 17. Psalm 51 and 17. And this is part of the miracle that God's Spirit works in a human spirit that is willing to submit to God and believe that He can give you an uncreated life inside you. Psalm 51 and 17. It's page 493. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. So if your spirit is touched by Jesus' spirit, you will have a contrite, penitent heart towards God. That's one of the ways you can tell you're a child of God. If you come to a situation where God shows you something and you say, No! I don't want to do that, and you have no right to ask me, and I'm not going to do it, then that's not the sign of a child of God. The sign of a person who is God's child is that his spirit or her spirit is penitent and soft and yielding. It is not a stubborn, rebellious spirit that says, no, I don't want to take that, I don't need to take it from anybody. The spirit of a child of God is penitent and soft and yielding. That's one of the marks. Another one, dear ones, is Ephesians 2 and verse 1. Ephesians 2 and verse 1. It's page 1017. Ephesians 2 and verse 1. And you he made alive when you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. And you he made alive. Your own spirit just senses an aliveness. Comes into a service like this, and it enjoys the singing, and enjoys everybody else being so friendly, and all that kind of thing, and looks forward to the lunch. Uh, But really, it enjoys most of all the sense of God's presence, and the sense of aliveness that there is. And you have a sense of aliveness yourself when you get down to prayer. You have a sense of a whole spiritual world that is going on behind this physical facade. And part of the witness of a child of God's spirit is that sense of aliveness inside. And so you have it whether you're on your own or whether you're with other people. Then the third mark is 1 John 5. 1 John 5. And verses 1 and 2. It's page 1067. 1 John 5 and verses 1 and 2. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is a child of God. And everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. Your own spirit, that used to be so independent and so brash, that used to rub up like sandpaper against everybody else, 
Your own spirit that had great difficulty even loving your mum and dad. Your own spirit begins to experience a great love coming out from inside it. And you begin to sense that the other people in this auditorium are your brothers and sisters. And you begin to find a love going out for them that you cannot explain yourself. And you are conscious that there has been a change in the direction of your whole life because there was once a time when you didn't feel like this towards other people at all. One of the marks of a child of God is that you have this love that is deeper than human empathy. Uh, I was once a liberal theologian and used to think, oh yeah, human empathy, that's it. Human empathy. Well, loved loved ones, there's lots of human empathy around. There's lots of philanthropy around. But this love is a love that really personally respects and wants the best for the people that you meet. And it is a love that is patient and kind, that is not jealous or boastful, that is not arrogant or rude, that is not irritable or resentful, that does not insist on its own way, that is not eager to believe the worst, but is eager to believe the best. It's a love that keeps on going. And that's one of the marks of the witness of your own spirit, that you experience that kind of love for other people. And the fourth mark is the way it expresses itself. It expresses itself in obedience to God's commandments. That's why old John says, you'll know how to tell whether you love people or not by whether you love God or not. And the way you'll know whether you love God or not is if you keep his commandments. And you'll find another thing that he mentions, you know, in that next verse, in verse 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and then just that's the big thing, you know, for every kid that respects his father. And his commandments are not burdensome. And a person who is a child of God has that clear sense inside their spirit. Your commandments aren't burdensome, Lord. They're a delight. They're things that I want to do. And even if some of them I'm having trouble with at this time, I want to do them. I want to obey you. And there's a joy inside that makes you rejoice to obey. Now, loved ones, that's some of the way that you can tell which world you belong to. Because God's Spirit inside witnesses that Jesus and He know you personally. And then that joins together with your own Spirit. Your own Spirit that you simply observe by looking at the way you affect other people. You don't need to look in a lot. You don't need to sit there and say, oh, I'm going to look in and introspect. No, because you'll probably persuade yourself that you're a saint. But just look, just look at what effect you have on other people. Look at how other people respond to you. Just from time to time as you're speaking to someone, think, do I really love that person? And if there's that kind of Jesus love coming from you, that's part of the sign that you're a child of God. So the beauty of it is you can know, you know. You don't need to sit here Sunday after Sunday wondering, well, am I or am I not? Probably if you're not sure, you're not. Really, no. Really, it's almost that. Some of you may say, well, does everybody have this assurance? Well, I can see how a brother or sister who's maybe having a bit of trouble, you know, over the old eating, or having a bit of trouble over some new light that God's Spirit has shown them, I can see that maybe temporarily you'll be having trouble with assurance. But, loved ones, the mark, the general mark and tenor of our lives should be an absolute assurance that we are related to the Creator of the universe, that He is our loving Father, and that we're a son or daughter that he knows, and that he has a place marked out for when this life is over. And that's God's will for us, you know. So I pray that, oh, you'll approach him yourself. And it seems to me the important thing is that personal relationship, isn't it? Do you know him, but do you know that he knows you? Well, you can't afford to be a name dropper, I suppose, that's it can't afford to be a name dropper in as serious a thing as this. can't afford to say, oh yeah, I know him. If you really are not sure whether he knows you or not. Let's pray. 
Dear Father, I would pray for each of my brothers and sisters and pray for myself that you would give us a great honesty and, Father, that you'd enable us to be real about these things. Father, we have all so despised the hypocrites. We have so hated those who used to go to our churches and pretend. Father, we have so sensed that you want to bring a new generation of real people into existence. Father, we want to be some of those real people. Father, I pray for brother or sister here who may see that he or she just does belong to that other world. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would show them how to stop living in that other world, how to stop living for themselves, getting frustrated with themselves and fed up with life, and how to turn to you and really believe that you are what you say you are, a loving Father who cares for us, and who has put all our selfishness into Jesus and destroyed it on the cross, and who is now willing to give us of yourself and your own life. Father, I pray that some of us will be able to receive that life today by faith and to start banking on it throughout this week and the coming years. For Jesus' sake, amen.